You're listening to The Corbett Report. CorbettReport.com Welcome, ladies and gentlemen. Welcome to episode 341 of The Corbett Report podcast. Welcome to the driverless future. So, do you want to see something really incredible? I mean, something mind-blowing, something you will scarcely believe? Watch this. Yes, for the benefit of those listening to the audio version of this podcast, I'm doing something that is truly phenomenal right now. I'm driving a car. Yes. Oh, wait. That isn't so incredible to you? That's not so amazing? You're not gasping in anticipation of what will come next? Well, look back on this podcast 20 years from now, and you may very well see this in a very different light. What am I talking about? Well, of course, I'm talking about the driverless future technologies that are now starting to come into view, and we are starting to be exposed to the propaganda conditioning that will eventually habituate us to the idea that driving a car, physically steering, choosing where to go, choosing how fast to go there, and choosing what to do in the event of some emergency situation will be taken out of our control. And as I say, you've probably seen this conditioning already starting in the last few years, and perhaps no better example of that kind of propaganda conditioning can be found than in the recent Kia advertisement slash propaganda piece called Peter Returns, in which the driverless technologies are being withheld from the masses that are clamoring from them by the evil Captain Hook, and it's up to the valiant Peter and Tink to go and save the day and defeat Captain Hook and release this technology to the masses. Yay, we have driverless technology. It is a fascinating piece of propaganda conditioning, but since this is an audio podcast, I will refrain from playing and analyzing the video in this podcast. But I think, as I say, you've probably seen this starting. You've, you've seen the, the press starting to come out to condition us into this driverless technology future. And it's not all positive press. It's not all singing the praises of this driverless technology. No, that would be too simplistic. I think the powers that shouldn't be know how to properly engineer ideas into society, not just by throwing them out there, but by also th throwing them out there in a way that, oh, maybe we should be careful about this. Oh, there's some problems with this technology, guys. We shouldn't just jump into this. And that is part of what I want to address today, because as I say, you've seen this uh, issue popping up even in the news lately, precisely and specifically for one particular aspect of this driverless technology. New concerns about self-driving cars after a fatal crash involving one of those cars. Police say Uber, using the technology killed a passenger. And now Uber has suspended its program testing those cars. Gio Benitez is here with the story. Good morning, Gio. Hey, Michael. Good morning. The National Transportation Safety Board is sending investigators to Tempe, Arizona. Police are still figuring out who was at fault. But there are serious questions now because this was part of Uber's pilot program to see whether this works at all. This morning, self-driving cars under intense scrutiny after police say an Uber using the technology hit and killed a woman in Tempe, Arizona. The vehicle was traveling northbound and the uh, pedestrian was outside of the crosswalk. Investigators say 49-year-old Elaine Herzberg was walking with her bike outside of the crosswalk late Sunday when she was hit by the car. A human operator was inside behind the wheel, but the car was in the self-driving mode. Uber suspending all self-driving tests from coast to coast. This appears to be the first pedestrian death involving an autonomous vehicle. At this point in time, it's sort of a wild, wild west situation, uh, and unfortunately someone lost their life because of it. This morning, experts tell us it's time to hit the brakes on autonomous car tests for now. Self-driving cars are legal in Arizona and several other states, and there have been accidents involving autonomous technology. In Los Angeles in January, a Tesla crashed into a parked fire truck. The driver said the car was in autopilot mode. Nobody was hurt. But on the tragedy in Arizona, Uber's CEO tweeting, incredibly sad news. We're thinking of the victim's family as we work with local law enforcement to understand what happened. 
Yes, today we're going to be talking about self-driving cars, but we're not going to be talking about that particular headline-grabbing aspect of the self-driving automatic car phenomenon, i.e. the safety concerns. So these self-driving cars are going to start going crazy and driving everywhere and killing people left, right, and center. And I think there are a couple of reasons why we don't need to concentrate on that particular aspect of the problem of automatic driving technology, although it is a problem, obviously, um, but it is the headline-grabbing one. So, first of all, that aspect of this will be well covered in all various forms of media, even in the mainstream. Uh, clutch our pearls, gasp in shock and horror. Wow, these computers that we hardly trust to run a desktop for you know more than a day without rebooting because we know the operating system is going to crash, but we'll allow these cars to drive us everywhere. No, of course there are going to be problems and malfunctions. And even if we go beyond that step towards the, well, what if it's not just a malfunction or malfunctioning software, but the question of how you write the software in the first place. Yes, the trolley car problem. Again, I'm sure we are all familiar with this problem from the uh, the recesses of moral philosophy and philosophical ponderings where we have the railway car barreling down the track and you're sitting there on the switch and you can either get, uh, send the train going to the left and killing five people who are standing there stranded on the tracks or you can send it to the right and you can kill one baby that's on the tracks. Which do you choose? Which person do you kill with your hand on the switch? <laughs> because that's always this the situation and that's the, always the only alternatives provided. Well, here is seemingly a real life version of the trolley car problem that actually may come into existence. What if you're in what if you're in the car and instead of you driving, what if it's the computer driving and the computer has to make the decision? Does it swerve to the left and hit the uh, the baby carriage in the middle of the pedestrian crosswalk? Or does it swerve to the right and hit the bus full of school children? Or does it go straight ahead and pum pummel into the elderly man uh, on the other side of the street? Or, or do you just sacrifice yourself and go off the edge of the bridge and fall into the water and die. I mean, again, this is your only question. Uh, these are your only choices. So what if you're the programmer programming the automatic driving technology software? Well, what do you program into it? What decision should be made? What what basis should a program, an algorithm use to determine, you know, who lives and who dies in a situation like that? I mean, drive for 18 billion hours and you might encounter a situation like that once. But anyway, here's a real world example. And, and who gets held responsible for the outcome of that, that sort of situation? Is it the car manufacturer? Is it the person who was in the vehicle at the time? Is it the, the software developer or the person who contracted the software developer? I mean, there's, there's certainly some issues to be worked out there and it is fascinating, which is why this is the aspect of self-driving car technology that gets all of the attention. But it itself is a form of PSYOP because it gets us thinking that the only real issue, the one thing, the one little thing to wrinkle that needs to be ironed out and then we can have this self-driving technology and everything will be okay is just to determine, well, what about the trolley car problem? What about the safety issues? What about if there's a malfunction or something? You know, what kind of overrides are there? If those are the only issues and the only problems that exist with this technology, then it's not an insurmountable problem. And yes, maybe it's not 100% soluble, but 99.99999% of the time for 99.99999% of the people, it will work well enough. And that's the calculated risk that we take every single day going out onto the roads, knowing that thousands and tens of thousands and hundreds of thousands of people around the world are dying on the roads every single year. It is a calculated risk to get in a car at all, whether you're in control or not. So it's only a question of how safe they can make it and uh, whether people will eventually overcome that that fear, that ick factor behind the, I'm not driving this, I can't trust it. And that ick factor exists. I remember the first time I was ever at an airport with one of those automatic going between uh, uh, terminals, uh, shuttles that they have, and hey, there's no one driving this. What if it malfunctioned? I mean, that, that thought, of course, will occur to people the first time they get in that type of situation. But the hundredth time, the thousandth time, the hundred thousandth time, the millionth time, it will be just background noise. And when it works a million times... We are inductive reasoners by nature. We will generally tend to trust the million in first ride. So I think the safety concern is a diversion, a psyop. They want you to concentrate on that. So what are some of the issues that are deeper, perhaps more fundamental to the problem of the 
automatic driverless technology future? Well, as of course, as my astute readers, listeners, and viewers will already know, one of the real questions behind this technology is, well, who is really in control of the vehicle at any given moment? I mean, is it just software? Is it just some sort of amorphous algorithm that's been programmed into a computer that can't be overridden and can't be taken control of? Is it is it just floating in the clouds and it treats everyone the same? Or could it be, could it just possibly be that this technology, like every other technology, is being provided to us by people who have the resources to provide that technology and may come with certain trap doors, certain hidden back door ways of accessing the, those control systems and overriding them as the case, as the need may arise. Well, whose need and in what situation? Uh, again, this is an aspect of the technology that isn't completely off the radar of even the mainstream news outlets. They are at least starting to talk about this problem. Well, is there a human in the loop? Does there need to be? In what situation? In what ways? This is the type of topic that is even broached by mainstream, respectable news organizations like Wall Street Journal in their uh, Technology News Brief podcast. So I'd love to get a little bit more of an understanding of the actual job in and of itself. Can you describe what some of these remote operators do? and What does their job entail and how does it work with the self-driving car tech? Well, let's be clear what we're talking about here, because uh, there's two kind of two kinds of technologies that are emerging. Okay. First, Waymo isn't using a remote control system like you think of as somebody sitting in a, a an office driving a drone somewhere on the other side of the world. The company says that they don't have the ability to to in real time move the car remotely. Some companies, such as Phantom Auto, a startup here in Silicon Valley, they have created technology that they say allows them them to drive the car from their office and not have anybody in the vehicle. And so those are two different kinds of technology. So what Waymo can do, and Waymo's not alone, others such as General Motors Cruise Automation and, and car tech uh, supplier uh, called Aptiv, they are developing a way to communicate with the vehicle. So it, let's say the robot car is driving down the street and it comes upon a stalled vehicle in its lane. You know, it looks like a stalled vehicle, but it's not quite sure. So the, the vehicle, the robot car has the ability to come to a safe spot and say, let's ping that operating center, that command center, and say, hey, I think this is a stalled vehicle, yes or no. And so what the operator will do is say, yes, it is a you know, the, the operator will be able to look at the, the cameras on the car and the sensors and, and see it and say, yeah, you're right, that is a stalled vehicle, and send that small command back. And then the onboard computer will then be able to say, oh, this is a stalled vehicle. My sensors tell me it's clear that I'm going to just pass this vehicle and, and keep go about my daily my daily business. But if it's still too complex, if it's still not quite understanding what to do, then that operator, that, that human back in the command center can then suggest a new path, a, a micro path, if you will. A say, hey, it, you know, take a, a left and essentially draws it out on a map and it, it sees where it can go. Now, What's going on here, though, is the computer, I'm told, still has the ability to say, no, I don't think this is safe. I see oncoming cars, but okay, now that car is, is free. I can pass, you know, make those kinds of decisions. But it allows the human to, from remotely, kind of interject the kind of the human understanding of a very complex world. So these are kind of the things that self-driving car developers are thinking about. How do you manage these kinds of situations? So, there you have it, folks. Yes, the companies that are developing these technologies are also taking into account the fact that you may need a human in the loop. So they're engineering their little back doors, so they'll be able to issue commands to your driverless car as need be in certain situations. Oh, is that a stalled car? Well, why don't you go around it uh, when it's safe to do so? Okay, yes, sir. And the computer will dutifully uh, obey those commands that are being sent by someone on the other end of some connection to some company through a back door that they have into your car. Your car? Well, that's an interesting question. Who is really in control here? Well, clearly it would be the humans who have that ability to interrupt, to override the controls, and to give issue commands as, uh, as they see fit. So it really isn't you. It isn't your car in any real sense uh, in that situation, is it? And the question of who really is in control here and 
under what circumstances will they take it over? Oh, don't worry. It's only for your benefit and your safety and to make sure that everything's okay. I'm sure most of the time it will be, but the once in a while, when they need to interrupt for different reasons, you may end up in a spectacular, spectacular fiery crash. Your untimely demise may be helped along by people on the other end of that connection. That, of course, isn't even beginning to broach the topic of hackers and just common thieves and criminals doing that type of activity. Of course, I'm talking more deep state, deep event type activity, but there is the hacker uh, idea of this as well, which has been also broached in the mainstream media. Well, if everything is hackable, including the vehicle that you're in that is barreling along the highway, that's a pretty large safety risk. And is that one that you're willing to take? Well, these are not rhetorical questions or empty philosophical ponderings. These have real world relevance, perhaps even to things that have taken place in the past, let alone in the future. And of course, as viewers of this podcast will know, episode 274 on crashes of convenience, Michael Hastings did broach that topic and did look at the Michael Hastings car crash as a potential example of just such an interrupted uh, driving experience uh, in which there may have been some controls that may or may not have been taken over to assure that uh, Michael Hastings did not reach his destination that fateful evening. So uh, that is a possibility, and it's not crazy conspiracy theorists like myself broaching that possibility. It is, as I pointed out in episode 274 of this podcast, please go and watch it or listen to it again uh, for the full detail, but as Former national uh, counterterrorism czar Richard Clark pointed out, well, was maybe Michael Hastings could have been uh, hacked into by some alphabet agency. Isn't that interesting? Or not just Richard Clark saying it, also DARPA, our friends at the Defense Advanced Research Project Agency, warning about the hackability of cars in the modern era. Good afternoon. Right, so we've been hearing a lot today about the importance of improving computer security. As Dan just alluded to, though, it's not just traditional computers that we need to worry about. There are many other kinds of systems as well. The slide that's been omitted uh, showed a result of uh, the researchers at UCSD and the University of Washington hacking into the dashboard display of a typical American sedan, making it show that the car was going 140 miles an hour while in park. Drilling down a little bit, modern vehicles consist of between 30 and 100 embedded control units, which are essentially small computers connected via a CAN bus. These cars are required by law to have a diagnostic port, typically located under the steering wheel, that allows mechanics to download diagnostic information and to perform software updates. In a first paper, the researchers from UCSD and the University of Washington showed that if they could touch the CAN bus through that diagnostic port, they could take over all of the functionality of the car that's controlled by software. And in a modern automobile, that's pretty much everything. The brakes are controlled by software because of anti-lock braking. The acceleration is controlled by software because of cruise control. And in those fancy new cars that can park themselves, even the steering is under software control. The reaction to this first paper was somewhat muted, perhaps because of the researchers had access to that diagnostic port, they were inside the car, and so already had physical access to the brakes, acceleration, and steering. They responded with a second paper in which they showed a variety of ways of touching that CAN bus without physically touching the car. These attacks involved infecting uh, the computers in the repair shop and then having that inspection, infection spread to the car through the diagnostic port or hacking in through the Bluetooth system or using the cell phone network to break in through the telematics unit that's normally used to provide roadside assistance. The most ingenious attack, though, used the stereo system in the car. The researchers were able to craft an electronic version of a song that played just fine in your home stereo system or on your personal computer. But when you put that on a CD and played it in the car CD player, it took over total control of your automobile. Yeah, right. Pretty scary, huh? So that presentation, which I also featured in episode 274 of the podcast, is itself now five years old. There's Dr. Kathleen Fisher, the program manager at DARPA, talking about these the ways that these the cars can be hacked. This was 2013, and they're talking about research that had already been done by that point. Well, here we are five years further down the road, to use that analogy, and if you look at the autonomous driving classification, they have this 
uh, autonomous uh, driving levels from zero to five. I'll throw a link in for those who are interested, but basically this refers to the various ways in which uh, driver driving technologies can be automated from level zero, where absolutely nothing is automated. So think pre-19, well, 80s, 90s type of vehicle where literally everything is directly under the control of the driver. Level one, you start to introduce things like acceleration or, or steering or a specific function that can be taken over by the car. So for example, cruise control is an example of level one automation of technology. Uh, level two would be two separate systems that are being independently controlled by uh, some sort of driverless function. So this is the idea of you can actually release, take your hands off the wheel and take your feet off the gas and and observe. Of, of course, you're going to be needed to correct and to to come up to uh, to face any situation that arises. But for a period of time, at any rate, you can take control, uh, take your hands off the controls. Level three would be upping that level of uh, consideration to the point where drivers are still necessary, but all system safety critical functions are performed by the assistant driver or the automatic driver or the computer driver. And uh, by level four, the vehicle is fully autonomous and drivers are only needed in emergency or, or safety critical situations or in some sort of very bizarre circumstance that requires human input. By level five, the highest level of automation, it's literally, there's nothing. There's no steering wheel. There's no controls you can take over. You are literally at the complete mercy of the, the computer. So the presentation that we just watched talking about the various ways your cars can be hacked in ways that could very easily kill you, we're just essentially talking about level one technology, uh, the steering control or, or, or cruise control, lane centering, that sort of thing. If that can be hacked, you could very easily be killed. Well, how much worse is it with every step up that ladder of driverless automation? And once you get to level five, it's game over. You just go in and it's like a lottery. You just hope that the thing is going to take you where you want and it's not going to try to kill you, <laughs> let alone any other things that could happen along the route. Um, so again, think of how much further along that road we are five years now from when that presentation was first given by DARPA and how much more control a would-be malicious entity would have in taking over your vehicle, and how much further along will be five years from now? 10, 20. At what point uh, does it become truly chilling, frightening, the level of control that any would-be hacker, alphabet super, or just run-of-the-mill criminal could have in the event of taking over your vehicle? Is it level three? Is it level four? Is it level five? At any rate, that, that point does come where it becomes truly horrific, the potential implications of wiring ourselves into this matrix. But <laughs> this is the corporate report, so we always go one level deeper because we've talked about the just the surface level safety issues. Well, what if these computers malfunction and start you know, running into pedestrians and what have you? Okay, that's a concern. It's a valid concern, but it's an it's a surmountable concern. It's something that will improve, all things being equal, will improve over time. And the, those types of accidents will occur less and less. So the PSYOP is to get you to think that is the only issue. And once that is overcome, then we're good. The deeper level would be to say, well, who's really in control of these cars? Because if they can be interrupted by whoever on the other side of whatever connection gets established to your vehicle, well, then you're not in control of your car. It is not your car. And you are at the whim and mercy of whoever is really in control. Uh, and there is another level to this because let's look at the bigger picture here. It's not just about ourselves individually in these cars. It is about society itself. Oh, America's love affair of the, with the car. We've heard that refrain so many times. And I'm sure it's been drilled into Americans. It's certainly even, I've, I've received this propaganda conditioning by proxy as a Canadian all my life hearing about, oh, you know, the American idea and ideal and spirit is captured in the essence of the America's love affair with the car because it represents freedom and you can go where you want to. And, and uh, that's what you look forward to when you're a kid. Oh, one day I'll be able to drive and, you know, get get out of Dodge and whatever else is acquainted, uh, uh, equated in our minds with that, that idea and getting out on the highway and driving these vast distances. 
as I broached momentarily in uh, uh, How Big Oil Conquered the World, that that entire idea, that system, that way of organizing society was itself engineered into society as part of a business plan, essentially, that was spearheaded in the 1950s, especially. Um, there was, of course, that period where I talked about with the the scrapping of the, the, the light rail networks that were the primary mode of urban transportation in the early part of the 20th century in the United States and elsewhere. And then, of course, the buying up of those rails and scrapping of them by conglomerates, including the big oil players and their cronies in the automotive industry, to make people use their own personal vehicles more. And another important step of that was to eliminate rail as a an intercity, as a long-distance option, by creating the interstate highway network. But of course, it was the Pentagon who spearheaded that project. And who was in charge of the Pentagon at that time? Oh, it was the old uh, boss of General Motors. Wow, what a coincidence. So I talked about that in uh, How Big Oil Conquered the World. But that gives you, I think, at least a sense, a window into the bigger picture here, which is that society itself, our entire conception of the world and how we how we travel through that world and the way the world is even ordered, physically ordered and structured around us depends on this infrastructure of the roads that have become the dominant form, uh, the dominant mode uh, for people to transport themselves. So our entire society has been deliberately structured around this idea of the car. And of course, it's not just a car, it's not just a vehicle, it's the fact that traditionally it was you owned, now more and more people would lease, but at any rate you own a vehicle, which do you really own it if you have to go and register it with the government? But anyway, you own your own vehicle and you and maybe your family or maybe your friend, maybe a couple of you, but often just you, will be driving yourself from point A to point B on the roads that are provided for you to do that. So you have this these predetermined routes that and you can select which one you want to go in, but these are your routes and these are the places you can go and these are the places you really can't go because there's no road there. The, the geographical reality of the roads and the space they open up and the space they close off is a type of limiting, a restriction of our previous freedoms that again, is incomprehensible to us, having grown up and lived our entire lives in the road-structured society. Um, but, having said that, uh, here we are in this this reality that's been engineered with these roads and the, the car that is basically equipped for a family to travel together. And you own it, and so you have to have a place to park it. So we have driveways and garages, and and we have parking lots in various places. Well, what if the, we turn from that sort of society into a driverless car society? Do you, I mean, you don't control the driverless car. Do you need to own a driverless car? Well, why? I mean, I'm sure there will be plenty of companies that will, maybe Ubers or their equivalents in the future, that will be happy to have a fleet of these driverless cars all around, and you just use your fondle slab and call one up, and it shows up in your door within two minutes, or your money back, or whatever, you know, kind of deal they, they offer. And you hop in, and it takes you to where you programmed it to. And that might be some sort of communal bus type system where it might be there you, maybe there are private ones that you can order for you and your family or just you or or at various levels that this can work but, but essentially like driverless taxis that'll just show up and take you where do you want to go but then you don't need the car to physically be there while you're sitting at work all day so you don't need a parking lot per se parking suddenly isn't this issue that it once was because you just have these fleet of cars going around our entire conception of this, of of all all of this geographical space around us, completely changes. Do we need a garage? Do we need a driveway? Do we need parking lots? What, what do we? How do we function in this society? Now, this is it's such an incredibly different concept for us to grasp in a, being in this reality. Now, it's exceptionally hard to get your mind around all of the different changes that would result from this seemingly innocuous change from driver cars to driverless cars. So, I'm going to provide you with a resource 
that I think, I hope, will spur you into thinking about the vast implications of this seemingly minor change in technology, uh, namely a podcast, the Econ Talk podcast, which if you are not subscribed to that podcast, you are doing yourself a disservice. It is a fascinating podcast, and although it is hosted by an economist who talks about economics, I wouldn't say it's an economics podcast, or at least not in any conventional sense or what you might think of when you hear that. It's these fascinating, in-depth, intellectual conversations about all sorts of different things that make you realize there is an economic aspect to human existence, but only because that economics only is describing the human interactions that we have. So almost any sub subject under the sun can be can fit under this economics uh, category. And it, it really is. It's a fascinating podcast. Uh, it's most of the time, sometimes yeah, hit and miss like everything else, but most of the time very thought-provoking. And this particular example I'm going to exhort you to listen to is no exception. It's a uh, fascinating one-hour exploration of this topic of the driverless future. And when I heard it, I thought immediately, I thought, oh, you know, uh, it's not going to be that interesting. And it's coming from a pretty mainstream perspective. They're, you know, they're not even talking about who's really controlling the car and the alphabet supers and that sort of thing. They're just talking about the way it changes society. But listening to that and thinking about all of the different ramifications of what this technology and its changes will bring about truly is mind-blowing. So I'm not going to do that podcast a disservice by playing a little clip here to get your mind going in that direction. I'm going to exhort you to go and listen to the full podcast. Of course, the link will be in the show notes for today's episode at corporatereport.com, like everything else I mentioned here today. But I will provide, I suppose, a, I don't know, a teaser, an appetizer? Um, at any rate, something to get your mind going in that direction from the much less thought-provoking and not at all recommended uh, radio slash podcast Radio Lab, which I've referred to disparagingly here on the program. I mean, I suppose it's not the worst program that's ever existed. I just do not like the whiz-bang, gee-golly editing and sound effects and nonsense and chicanery they do and the dumbing down. Um, but at any rate, they did talk about this topic uh, not so long ago, and so this will make a more palatable one or two minute clip for you to listen to to get your mind going in this direction. What we're really talking about when we talk about the changeover from driver society to driverless society. The thing that I've been pretty obsessed with lately is actually not fake news, but it's automation and artificial intelligence and, um, and driverless cars mm. because it's going to have a larger effect on society than any technology that I think has ever been created in the history of mankind. I know that's kind of a bold statement, but <laughs> quite bold. Uh, but you've got to imagine that, you know, that there will be in the next 10 years, 20 to 50 million jobs that will just vanish uh, to automation. Um, you've got, you know, million truckers that will lose their jobs. Um, uh, the, but it's not, we think about like automation and driverless cars and we think about the fact that um, they are going to uh, – the people that just drive the cars, like the taxi drivers and the truckers, are going to lose their jobs. But what we don't realize is that there, there are entire industries that, that are built around just cars. So, for example, if you're not driving the car, why do you need insurance? There's no parking tickets because your driverless car knows where it can and cannot park and goes and finds a spot and moves and so on. Um, if there are truckers that are no longer using rest stops because driverless cars don't have to stop and pee or take a nap, then all of those little rest stops all across America are affected. People aren't stopping to use the restrooms. They're not buying burgers. They're not staying in these hotels and so on and so forth. And and then if you look at driverless cars to a next level – the whole concept of what a car is well, is going to change. So, for example, right now, a car has five seats and a wheel. But if I'm not driving, well, what's the point of having five seats and a wheel? You could imagine that you take different cars. And maybe when I was on my way here to this interview, I wanted to work out. So I called a driverless gym car. Or I have a meeting out in Santa Monica after this, and it's an hour. So I call a movie car to watch a movie on the way out there. Or an office car, and I pick up someone else, and we have a meeting on the way. And all of these things are going to happen not in a vacuum, but simultaneously, this, you know, pizza delivery drivers are going to replace by robots that will actually cook your pizza on the way to your house in a little box and then deliver it. And so kind of a little bit of a, a long winded answer, but I, I truly do think that, um, that it's going to have a, a massive, massive effect on society. 
So you get the idea here, right? The bigger picture of all of this. It's not just a question of a changeover in te technologies. It's not just a question of the safety risks that that poses. It's not just a question of the risks of the basically control uh, that uh, this gives the, the oligarchs who wield the technological power to literally control where certain individuals go and whether or not they live or die in their, their little, uh, well, what could end up being suicided machines, uh, to use the Michael Hastings example. It's also that the entire infrastructure of our society has been hardwired by these roads that have become the dominant f way that we organize and structure our daily lives, our, our geography. Our geography itself is defined by these arterial lines that, uh, that make up the access to the rest of the world. And as much as our freedom has been limited and curtailed by the development of this system in which you are allotted and prescribed certain lines in which you can move and travel, well, what about when the, even the, the question of which of those lines you take and how you go there and whether you go and, or stop or speed up or slow down or steer the car, all of that is taken away from you. The amount of convenience continues to increase. The amount of human input continues to decrease. Turn your mind off, do other things. But gradually, it becomes less and less about an actual lived human experience and more and more about getting us sunk into the mediated matrix reality of, of nothingness that is going to define us in the future. And there's a lot of different implications for that. And I'm just trying to open this conversation up and start getting people to think about this. If not for the sake of people who are watching this or listening to this podcast here today in 2018, then perhaps for the sake of my children or my yet-to-be-born grandchildren who may not even understand what it is that Grandpa was railing about when he said, I would never drive one of, get in one of those driverless are death traps. Why? Why is it? It's, it's a much deeper issue than merely the issue of safety, which can and probably will be mostly overcome. And that's the whole point. They want you to get, to get you to believe, well, as long as it's safe, then it's okay. But it's not about safety. It's not about convenience. It's about the human experience and what it is becoming and what we want it to become. Some very deep philosophical points here. So I hope you will check out that podcast, uh, the Econ Talk podcast, that uh, really, I think, lays this out in a way that, that's quite thorough and quite, uh, quite engaging intellectually. Um, and of course, I'm always interested in hearing your thoughts on this topic. That's going to do it for this week's edition of the Corbett Report podcast. I'm James Corbett of CorbettReport.com, looking forward to talking to you again very soon. The Corbett Report is brought to you by The Corbett Report Subscriber. A weekly newsletter featuring James Corbett's International Forecaster Editorial, recommended reading and viewing, discounts on Corbett Report DVDs, and once a month, a subscriber-only video. Sign up today to start receiving your copy at corbettreport.com support.